Today we want to discuss members of the kingdom Protista. Now the Protestans are composed primarily of two groups, the algae and the protozoans. But since we're dealing uh, primarily with plant type organisms, we'll be working almost exclusively with the algae. Now, one of the major characteristics of algae is that they're eukaryotic. That is to say that as a true nucleus cell type organism, this means that their nucleus is surrounded by a membrane and it has regular, uh, the standard chromosomes with DNA inside the nucleus. Also, algae cells have plastids, chloroplasts for photosynthesis, and leucoplasts for storage of starch that they form or store uh, through the process of photosynthesis. Some of them also have vacuoles. For example, gas vacuoles are important because this provides a flotation device so that the algae can remain up near the top of lakes and ponds uh, where they can photosynthesize obviously more effectively. Algae are particularly suited for an aquatic habitat because they lack certain things that are found in higher plants. For example, algae lack vascular tissue. This vascular tissue uh, provides support and transport for organisms uh, that are terrestrial or land-based plants, but since algae get support from the density of water and get transport, that is movement of nutrients and wastes, from the water that surrounds them, the lack of a vascular system is not really all that significant. Another characteristic that's very important is that algae have no cuticle. A uh, cuticle protects leaves in a terrestrial habitat from insects and fungi and from desiccation or drying out. Uh, but since algae live in water, they don't really need that kind of protection that's that a uh, uh, rhododendron or an oak tree or some other terrestrial plant might have. Also associated with this aquatic habitat is that most algae have motile sex cells. That is, they have gametes that can swim from one plant to another as part of their sexual reproduction. Algae are all photosynthetic. That is, they have the ability to take light energy in their aquatic habitats and convert that light or use that light to provide the energy to convert carbon dioxide and water to glucose. Algae also have cell walls that are composed of cellulose, cellulose that we see very commonly in higher plants. Some algae have some very distinct types of substances besides cellulose in their cell walls, but again, that's something we'll talk about in another part of this lecture. Now, let's take a look through the microscope at a couple of types of algae that we would commonly find in lakes and ponds in this region. Now, the first type of algae that we want to take a look at is a very simple single cell form called euglena. Now, euglena is a very unusual organism because euglena is actually half plant and half animal. That is to say that it can photosynthesize like a plant, that is, it's autotrophic, and it can feed on nutrients or organic matter outside its body like an animal that is heterotrophic. This combination of autotrophic and heterotrophic is referred to as a mixotrophic mode of nutrition. Because euglena can take and survive and do nicely in all kinds of habitats, it, like Escherichia coli that we talked about in a previous lesson, is an ecological indicator. High levels of euglena in ponds or lakes can often indicate sewage pollution. A second type that we want to look at is the genus Volvox. Volvox is an unusual algae in that Volvox is a colonial form. Rather than being single cell like euglena, Volvox is a group of single cells band together to form a colony. Now, rather than these single cells acting individually, each of them does a specific function for the colony. Some reproduce, some photosynthesize. From an evolutionary standpoint, this is very important because basically what it means is that Volvox types are a transition from the single cell forms like euglena to the multicellular forms we're going to talk about later, like some of the marine algae. Now, before we leave 
our discussion of the simple algae, we ought to take a look at a few other types, some diatoms and some green algae. And probably the best area for us to work with these types of algae is to go to a local trout stream. The algae, aquatic algae, can be divided basically into two groups. Those that are found in what is referred to as a lentic habitat, that is standing water such as ponds, lakes, or the oceans, and those that are found in what is referred to as the lotic habitat, lotic means running water, uh, such as rivers, creeks, and for example, the stream that we're filming next to today, uh, Rochester Creek, which is a very good trout stream. Now, within those algae associated with lotic habitats, probably the two most important groups are the diatoms and the simple green algae, and that's what we'll talk about in this segment. Now, the diatoms are primarily single-celled algae, and uh, in a subsequent lecture, we'll talk about them in lakes and oceans. Uh, in oceans, in the cooler oceans, where they're found in the billions, uh, these are constantly dying and settling to the bottom and accumulating on the bottom. Now, what's unusual about diatoms in general is that they have cell walls called valves that have the normal cellulose, but they also have a substance called silica in the cell walls. Well, when they accumulate in the bottom of the ocean, vast deposits of this silica called diatomaceous earth accumulates. And of course, this has commercial value uh, used in pool filters for soundproofing and for insta uh, excuse me, insulation. In freshwater habitats, the diatom growth pattern, especially in lotic habitats, is quite different. Diatoms grow uh, encrusted on rock surfaces. Uh, as a crusty growth, they're known as paraphyton. Now, paraphyton is any kind of plant that grows attached to rocks or other substrate. See if we can find a rock. Here's one where you can see this crusty brown growth that's forming on the surface of the rock. Uh, it may be somewhat difficult to see. This growth is paraphyton and it's diatoms. Now, basically, you can tell without even looking at the rock if you step in the stream. If the stream is very, very slippery, it's probably because there's a tremendous amount of diatomaceous growth on the rock surface. Uh, the other group that we're going to talk about in a moment you can see on this rock as well, and that's the filamentous green algae. Now, whether we're talking about the diatoms or the algae, Remember that as plants in these streams, they're the producers, they're the primary producers, and all of the other organisms, all the animal life in the stream, rely on this for food. Uh, all of the aquatic invertebrates, uh, including aquatic insects that are in turn fed on by fish, rely on this as the base of the food chain. That applies to algae, of course, in lakes and oceans as well. Now, the other group that I wanted to mention is the filamentous green algae. And although they're very common in streams such as this, as paraphyton growth, they're also fairly common in ponds and lakes. And in ponds, you may think of uh, pond scum, that green slime you see covering the pond uh, during the summer months, especially in very rich ponds. Uh, the simple green algae actually are filament, referred, or form in long, thin filaments, and they're referred to as the filamentous algae. They go through a very unusual type of sexual reproduction called conjugation. And in conjugation, all of the genetic material from one filament of algae flows into the cells of the other filament. This then forms, as in all sexual reproduction, a zygote, you're combining genetic material from two parents, so it's sexual reproduction. This zygote, that's sort of football-shaped, then develops into a zygospore, which is resistant. So if the pond or the tiny stream that this green algae is living in dries up and the adult population dies back, those zygotes or zygospores will survive. And when water returns, of course, it'll germinate and start a new algae population. The green algae especially, such as spirogyra, but more importantly like volvox that we talked about in the previous lecture,
are very important in plant evolution because uh, most botanists feel that all higher plants that we'll talk about in much later lectures uh, arose from ancestral green algae types very similar to Volvox. Volvox, for example, forms colonies, the, the beginning of what we think of as a multicellular structure. They have chlorophylls A and B, typical of higher plants. Advanced sexual reproduction, egg and sperm. They also have starch, that is, they store their food as starch, and they also uh, have cellulose in the cell walls, which is considered characteristic of higher plants. Before we leave our discussion of the algae, I want to use one of the types of algae, uh, a diatom, as an example of a major global problem that environmentally uh, all of us face, all the countries of the world, and it's especially devastating in the U.S. and North America. And that's the invasion of species that we call exotics or invasive species. Because countries of the world are now so closely linked, and because there has been so much uh, transport of goods, uh, industrial products, etc., from country to country, and bodies of water to bodies of water via ships, a lot of invasive species have been introduced into this country, especially aquatic ones. We're going to use a, a diatom, Didymo, as an example of how devastating this can be. Now, diet Diatoms, as you know, are single-celled organisms, and Didymo, like the rest of the diatoms, is a single-celled organism. But one of the unusual things about it is that it can group together to form huge masses of these, this diatom clump that makes it almost look like a filamentous algae. The source of Didymo appears to be in Eurasia, in northern Europe and parts of northern Asia. And for a long period of time, it has been indigenous to those areas and seemingly under control. Nobody really understands how this species has gotten out of control, but even in these countries, its population is exploding. It entered into the U.S. Uh, from the West Coast, probably by shipping, but since it's a single-celled organism, it could have come in and been transported to this country in almost any way. Somebody that was fishing in Europe might have had some cells on their boots, or uh, almost every scenario you can think of could have occurred. When it came into the West Coast, for a while it was isolated uh, in the higher elevation streams. Now, it's a cold water stream or lake type of diatom. But it's spread. And one of the problems now is that it is starting to appear in the Northeast. And there have even been some cases of Didymo appearing in New York State. For example, they have now found it in the Esopus Creek in the Hudson Valley, one of the most found, famous trout streams in the world. You can see that it forms this rather disgusting looking huge mass of algae. Uh, it looks like it's slimy, but it's actually got the uh, feel of rough cotton. If it's not controlled, you can see how it can spread and almost completely cover the bottom of streams or lakes, shallow lakes, or ponds, or rivers, and completely shut off oxygen exchange and light to all the life forms underneath. What ecologists, what aquatic ecologists are concerned about is Didymo might mean that these streams will die or at least change so drastically that they'll no longer be uh, the important recreational streams and lakes that they are now. There is no known control for Didymo. Uh, that's one of the great concerns with exotics is, or invasive species, how do you control them? Uh, in some cases we've done it with biological control, purple loosestrife that was an invasive that was such a problem.
uh, we've got a control now in terms of a weevil that's been introduced to feed on. Uh, water chestnut, there's no control for that that's uh, quite prevalent in the Hudson and now is appearing in the Finger Lakes, as a matter of fact. Uh, likewise with Didymo, no control. About the only thing we can do to try to prevent the spread is for uh, people to check the bottom of their boats or check their waders if they're going from trout stream, trout stream excuse me, to trout stream. But unfortunately, it appears that this is something that nature's going to have to control, and we don't know how or when that will happen.